Hi, my name is Alexandra Gromfors and I'm a stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma survivor. Um, I was diagnosed back in September 2020. And during that time, I was a full-time teacher and I stopped teaching and began painting artwork. So now I'm a full-time artist. <laughs> Hi, have we met? I'm Alexandra and I'm thrilled to have you here. I wanted to quickly introduce myself, but you're also gonna have to meet my dog, Hippo. This is my studio assistant. <laughs> I'll take you back at the start. I went through a breakup. I was with this person for about five years and that was in November of 2019. And I was super stressed as most people are during the breakup, but around the same time I started to lose weight. I started to experience what, night sweats, um, my hair was actually like thinning out quite a bit. My hairdresser actually mentioned it. He's like, are you healthy? Like there's something different about your hair texture. Um, so I just noticed all these little symptoms, but I kind of thought they were to do with a breakup. <laughs> like, oh, I'm just stressed. I'm just like, you know, and I, I still to this day don't actually know what was stress and what was cancer. Um, even my doctor's like, we have no way of knowing what was what. Um, but then a few months later, so that was in November, in July, I noticed I had uh, lymph, like swollen lymph nodes here on my shoulder. And I actually have like a lipoma here, which is just a fatty tissue deposit, which I had gotten tested like a year ago. It's non-cancerous. It just is what it is. But my swollen lymph node was right beside it. So I was like, well, that's weird. Like, why is this one hard and this one soft? And I couldn't quite figure out what was going on. And then another swollen lymph node kind of happened around here. And then one at the back. So like within three days of feeling it, I Googled it. Everyone says don't Google, but I'm like, no, Google. Because <laughs> that's what saved me. So I had Googled this like a year ago, my lipoma. And I read about Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I was like, oh, no, it's not that. Like, it must be whatever. Nothing serious and then so then a year like basically a year later i googled it again like you know swollen bump on neck and i was reading all the symptoms of hodgkin's lymphoma a year later and i was like oh my goodness like <laughs> i'm pretty sure i have this and i'm not a hypochondriac but i was like i have night sweats i had like a little bit of a rash a little itchiness again i don't know what is what i don't know it was such sneaky sneaky symptoms that i still don't know you know, I had weight loss. I also um, went off birth control at that time, which can cause you to like lose weight. So again, don't know what is what. Um, my hair, everything. So I had gone to my like doctor within three days of getting the swollen lymph nodes. And right away, they began testing. So I first had uh, ultrasound. The ultrasound came back abnormal. They just said this, the shape of the lymph nodes were off. So they wanted to do like a more in-depth ultrasound. So I went back for another ultrasound, did blood work. Nothing in my blood work appeared. Um, but the, yeah, which is really strange for a blood cancer, you would think it would show up, but it never actually appeared until like the day before I started chemo. which is like mind boggling to me that a blood cancer didn't appear. And I go for every six months for blood work to make sure, you know, I'm still in remission. And that's how we determine it. And it kind of like it drives me insane because I'm like, my blood work didn't show cancer for months. But anyways, so yeah, that's kind of my lead up to it. Got an MRI and then it was the biopsies that they actually had to do to diagnose Hodgkin's lymphoma. So they did like a needle one. Um, it came back inconclusive. So then they actually cut. Uh, I do have a scar here and um, took a sample tissue sample. And that's how they were able to diagnose it. So I just wanted answers because it had been months of like just testing and doing blood work and ultrasounds. I'm like, these are great and I appreciate it, but nothing's being done. <laughs> that was like in July and now it was September. So I was like, this is a long time to just be like trying to figure it out. So I was, I was, I loved the biopsies because I'm like, please cut me, <laughs> like, find what you need to. Whereas a lot of people get very nervous about them, but I was just so happy to get some answers. So the needle, like they freeze the area, but you're awake during it. So I'm just chatting away to the doctor and he was lovely. And um, so they said it could take up to like two weeks or something to get the results back. He got back to me like right away. 
Um, then they gave me the option, would I like to do the needle one again to avoid scarring or do they want to just cut and get tissue sample? And I was like, oh, just cut. Like, let's just get the show on the road. So um, I had just, I'm just going to back up a little bit. I had just landed my dream teaching job right before COVID. I went to school to be a teacher. I really wanted to teach at my elementary school, my like my own one. And I got a job there full time, grade five. So I was so pumped up. Um, COVID had hit. That's when I actually had started like kind of painting. And then I was seven days into teaching my you know, my school year at my dream school. And I told my principal, I was like, I'm so excited to be here, but heads up, like <laughs> I'm going for a biopsy. And then on a Friday afternoon, I was at school. We had just had a staff meeting. I'm on my way back to my classroom. I check my phone and I see it's my doctor ringing. He always called Friday afternoons. And I was like, okay, these are the results of the biopsy. I answered it and he's like, okay, Alexandra, um, Good news, bad news is what he said. Good news is I've got an answer for you. Um, and it's a good type of cancer. Bad news is you do have Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I was in my classroom at the time. Um, and I just, I like, I had a good relationship with my doctor. So I just wanted to listen. And of course, like, I don't, I don't really understand what this means. And it was COVID at the time. So he's like, you got to pack up and you're not teaching anymore because you're going to start chemo in two weeks. I was thinking I was like stage one or two, just because I could feel the lymph nodes here, but I couldn't feel them anywhere else. But um, I had cancer in my, my neck, my lungs around my spleen. <laughs> So I did 12 rounds of chemotherapy, didn't have radiation, no surgery. So my first chemo that I went to, I was like, oh, this is a walk in the park. I've got this <laughs> because I guess your body's not used to chemo yet. Um, so it was fine. And then as time went on, each chemo got progressively worse. I dealt with a lot of nausea. So probably around, I think it was the second chemo, I woke up and I was like, oh, I don't feel well, but like, it's all in my head. I'm just going to push through. I'm going to have a shower. I'm going to get ready for my day. I ended up passing out in the shower because I guess my, my blood pressure was so low at that point. And I wasn't, I was just trying to push my body to be like, you know, mind over matter type of scenario, which I shouldn't have done. So I learned pretty quick, like, okay, this is actually pretty serious. Um, and then by chemo four, I was experiencing like a lot of shortness of breath. And that was from one of the chemo drugs I was on. So I was hospitalized at that point. And uh, yeah, so that, that was just being my breathing. I don't think there was any damage necessarily done to my lungs, but I think I may have caught it at a good time. So they did lower my dosage at that point on that chemo drug. Um, so my main thing was nausea. I experienced a lot of nausea and I just felt like the medication I was taking kind of masked the na nausea, but then they would cause like other side effects. I think at one point I counted, I was on like 12 different medications. <laughs> like it was just because you're just keep masking and masking and masking the symptoms. Um, so I didn't love that around. Actually, my first chemo, I had a girlfriend who cut hair. So she, I had long blonde hair and she cut it short and dyed it hot pink because <laughs> I knew I was going to lose my hair. So a cute little pink ball, which I loved. Um, and then around chemo five is when I really started to lose like chunks of hair and shaved my head. Um, yeah, so I did have a shaved head from chemo like six to 12. And going through relationship problems and being, you know, recently single and then having to move into my parents' house and now being at 29 years old, like bald, living at home, you know, not working. I just felt so defeated and shaving my head was just kind of like that cherry on top where it's like, now you've lost your hair too. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's also super spiky and it's growing. It's very confusing. So as a female, like 29 and single, it was just so um, hard on my self-esteem for sure. But the good thing is hair does grow back, but still that time was, you don't know how long it's going to take to grow back. Okay, so I finished obviously doing my hair tonight and I gave myself a mohawk. Rock on, why not, right? I did purchase um, my friend's 
created a GoFundMe account and they raised money for a wig. So I did buy like a really nice um, wig that looked pretty much like my bio hair. So I, that was kind of my safety net. I did wear that a lot. Looking back now, I like kind of wish I didn't, you know, like embrace the baldness, but that was what gave me comfort. So I wore that wig a lot. Honestly, the biggest thing for, I'm a go, go, go type person. I don't take naps. Like I never have been a napper, but for me during chemo and when I was dealing with the nausea and just like mentally drained from it, sleeping was the best cure. Um, I did have home hydration. So staying hydrated really helped. Um, I felt like drinking water was actually making me more nauseous, but the IV through my pick line for hydration really helped. So, and then I would just sleep. I would sleep basically four or five days after chemo. And then my mind's not thinking about it. My body is resting. It was only when I'd wake up and be like, oh, then I would really feel the nausea. Also with food, would make a big difference. I feel so horrible for my amazing mother who would cook me a ton of different foods just trying to feed me. But like you get this weird metallic taste in your mouth. So certain foods weren't sitting well. So I just kind of was like, it took me a few chemos to realize like, hey, if I don't eat a lot during these four or five days, so be it. I would like basically eat a ton the week after when I was feeling good. So I kind of did a lot of binge eating, but that's just what worked for me. And I was able to stay like the same weight all through treatment. I was really active on my weeks off chemo. I had gotten a puppy at the time. My mom did. So I was taking the dog for walks, going for hikes. So I really um, monopolized my time off of chemo and took full advantage of it to be active outside. And that helped with my mental health too and physical. Yeah. Woohoo! So I was super privileged in that during chemo, I painted so hard, I saved a ton of money living at home, and I bought my first um, condo, like my first home, the second my chemo 11 out of 12. So, so for me, it was like so many life changes, right? And then within the next couple of weeks, I would say like a couple months after, then it kind of started to hit me like, wow, what did I, what just happened? <laughs> So then I, I, I believe I was going back, I went like three months um, for a scan after that. And then now it's just been every six months for five years. Um, and then I'll be cleared. So really good news, today is my last day of chemo. Finally, it's been the longest six, six months ever. I've been counting down to this day for a very long time. Kind of feels like it's my birthday. And then I was so grateful I had my painting during that time because that's really what got me up in the morning was like, okay, like, what am I going to paint today? And how am I going to market myself in my business? And how can I progress my life in a way when it feels like everything else is falling apart, right? My art business was the one thing where I'm like, look at this blank canvas. I can create something by the end of the day that is beautiful, that is unique and special, and I can sell it and I can do this for myself, right? Which brings joy to other people as well. So I really just invested all my extra time and energy into it. So that was one of my first questions I asked my doctor was about fertility because that was so important to me. I always wanted to be a mom. Um, I talked to him about it and basically he said not to worry that lots of chemo patients on this type of chemo will go on to have children later in life. Looking back, I really wish I had a push to get my eggs frozen at that stage um, because here in Canada, like if you get your eggs frozen, then it will be covered. Um, not only are you healthier, younger, um, and it gets covered by the government. Whereas when I finished treatment, then I decided, okay, now I really want to go and see what my options are because most of the other girls my age who were going through the same thing as me, they had pretty much all gotten their eggs frozen outside of Canada. So that kind of made me extremely nervous. Um, so I went through fertility testing on my own after treatment. Um, in which case I only got about halfway through the testing because it started to get super expensive and to actually go and get your eggs removed and frozen on your own um, is 
pretty risky for one that it will actually work and also super expensive. So I unfortunately had to stop. And that's when I found out that if I had done it before treatment, it would have been covered. So I was really upset that that information wasn't given to me beforehand. I think, first of all, you do have to do your own research. And I think that when your doctor is telling you the information, it's all new, right? So you don't have time to process it. So you really need to make sure that you go home and you process it and you research. And then you feel brave enough to go with your questions and push for the correct answers. And I do think it's wise to Google. And I do think it's wise to ask other people in the medical field and get second advice because it's only going to like give you knowledge and knowledge is powerful. Power. I think it's a really scary um, thing to obviously go through, and especially when you're younger and, and you only hear of people having cancer much older. But the scary thing is, is it can happen, right? And life is short. Um, and just to find those people around you who really truly care about you and are there for you during that time. Um, in a way, I do find that what I went through at such a young age is a blessing because I have um, been given so much insight about the world around me and uh, it's changed my perspective. So there are a lot of silver linings with it. I think I've matured in some ways way faster than a lot of people my age have. And I'm really thankful for that. Um, and it's just to find something that's going to get you up in the morning and get you excited to still be alive. <laughs> For me, it was art and it was getting a puppy. <laughs> and I know the doctor's like, don't get, don't get a dog. But like it, the dog got me outside. It got me walking, made me laugh. So just finding anything and being around people who truly care about you, I think is really the key to getting through that time and know that there is an end. Like it is going to get better. I mean, I still have moments where I think back and like, I'm in shock, but overall, like I've gotten through it and I'm proud of myself for getting through it, right?